Hey guys, welcome to Catch Fire Podcast. I'm excited to be back for our third season. And I just want to encourage everybody who's tuning in to be sure to subscribe. Also, leave a comment. Let us know how you feel about the podcast and be sure to share it because, you know, we're living in a time where social media is the new evangelistic tools and promotion tools that God has given us to do the work and to do the ministry. And I know all of you are connected. So I want to encourage you to share this with your friends and your followers and all the people you're connected to because today i've got a really awesome awesome guest who's a little bit more like a friend and we've developed such a mighty relationship these last few years he's somebody that all of us know and uh, especially if you are a major league baseball sports fan he's a four-time world series champion he was nominated to go into the hall of fame but most of all, he is a Hall of Famer in the kingdom of God, and he's my friend. And it's good to be with our good friend, Daryl Strawberry. <laughs> Daryl. <Pastor> Thanks, <laughs> brother. I what appreciate is, you, man. Man, I appreciate <laughs> you, man. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy, man, uh, how we came into connection and, um, and how you've just come into our lives, man. It's just amazing. And you've been such a great blessing, not only to me and our staff, to our whole church man thanks for being on the podcast well thank you for having me on the podcast you know i just really appreciate you know when i met you the first time and coming into your church house you just kind of let me be me yeah, and yeah. which is really cool you yeah. know when you can walk into a church and possibly just be you yeah you know, absolutely. And, you know help the people yeah because at the end of the day that's truly what it's all about are we helping the people yeah and you know it's amazing the heart that god has given you um people always ask me to go how's daryl How's Daryl, you know, you, you know, and, and I think people probably know or feel this way, you know, who followed you throughout your career that, you know, you were not only an icon, you are an icon in, in Major League Baseball, and not only are you one of the greatest performers on the field, but for our generation, you are a lot of our hero, you know, a hero, hero to a lot of us on the field. And people always ask me, how is Daryl? How is it being connected with Daryl or getting to know him? And I just say every time I go, Daryl is about people. He loves people. And it's so true. What, what is it about people that gets you so excited? Well, that's because my mother was that way. Mm. And I watched her. Mm -hmm. um, she was a woman of faith. Mm -hmm. But I watched her love on people mm -hmm. while I was being successful. Wow. Um, of course, she was praying for me. But she was loving on other people. And she was going about her business um, and who she was in her faith and helping others, mm -hmm. um, showing the compassion and love for people. Mm -hmm. So I believe that's where I got that from, yeah, yeah. you know, the importance of that, of watching that and recognizing that. Because see, as kids, when we watch things, we recognize them, we're going to, mm -hmm. eventually we're going to do some of the same things, even if they're bad, you mm -hmm. know, because I watched my father in a different right. way. And I ended up doing some of the things the wrong way, just like he did. Um, Hello. So it, it, it happens. Yeah. But I watched this little woman of my mother, you know, just have this loving and caring for people. I mean, just taking care of people, um, providing for them. You know, she saw that her son was blessed. So she would take what I had accomplished and not to use it for, say, look at me. She was using it help other people mm, that's amazing and i thought that was remarkable yeah and, and i know that's why i'm like i am today is yeah. because i saw that and i know that's the good of what we supposed to be you know and yeah. what, what we were created to be mm -hmm. and you know none of us are created for for wrong you know it just happens in our yeah. life you know no matter who you are right and i think a lot of times people don't really recognize that they think well you know why why would he even take those type of roads? We don't yeah. know why, what happens yeah. in people's lives behind closed doors, and closed doors are real. You know what's amazing to me is, um, and we were talking about this earlier, is that you know God really chooses people, um, and really we know it's all God. You know Whether you are a Christ follower or not, um, we know that he's, he's the creator. He, he's, yeah. he's in charge. And um, you know how God really chose you out of the streets of, Lo of South Central Los Angeles, which I'm from LA originally, so I'm very familiar with the area where you grew up, went to Crenshaw High School, um, gave you this incredible talent to play baseball and basketball and football, and you were in all the sports, but baseball was the one that took you to the professional level. Um, you were drafted number one. Were you drafted number one? Number one, 1980. Number one, 1980 by the Mets. Uh, went on to do great things with the Mets, obviously, then with the Yankees, then with the Dodgers. 
and saw the pinnacle of success, but yet you never forgot where you came from. <laughs> and that's what I love about you. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I think it's important that we recognize who we are, even when we're young and we have struggles, mm -hmm. we recognize something that we don't want to be. You know, and I didn't want to be a person uh, to run around with pride and just say, look at me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted to say, yeah. look at others. Mm. You know, because others will never, might have the opportunity that I had, like I did playing Major League right. Baseball. Right. So I never wanted to forget where I came from. I always yes. wanted to remember the fact that I came from nothing so I'm going to leave here with nothing. That's so true. Right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so I end up in the naked middle. Naked you came, <laughs> naked you will leave. Yeah. yeah. So I end up in the middle of all of this, mm -hmm. you know, throughout all the ups and downs. But I always remember, I didn't have nothing anyway when I first started this. Wow. It's amazing. You know, uh, let's talk a little bit about baseball. I remember you were, uh, uh, l and let me ask you this question. Because the span of your career is enormous, and you had so many experiences, uh, maybe you can give me what is the what was the greatest achievement in sports? What was your your highest moment in sports? Uh, what was your lowest moment? And maybe we could talk about the highest moment. Like what was the, what was the greatest <laughs> experience you had being a professional baseball player? I think the greatest experience I had was being able to be on winning teams. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Because I think people don't understand it's, it's so hard, you know, because you've had a lot of players who have played at the same level I played, mm -hmm. but they never got a chance to smell what it's like to win. That's good. When you look at a guy like Ernie Banks. Oh, yeah. He was a great player, but he never even made it to the playoffs. Yeah, that's amazing. With the Cubs. Yeah. The people and when know. you think about yeah. guys that He played, was like a Willie Mays. He was yeah. very, very close to exactly. that. Exactly. Right. And you think of guys that played long-term careers and never got a chance to understand what that feels like. It, mm -hmm. That's a different feeling because, see, I grew up right. a kid watching the Dodgers in L.A. Mm -hmm. and, and the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah. And I watched those guys play. Big Red Machine. Yeah, Big Red Machine when they had Johnny Bench, Tony. Yeah. Um, Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan, Tony Perez. Yeah. Pete Rose. Yeah. And I became a fan of baseball because of the Dodgers and the Reds. And I remember when they used to play and it'd be the game of the week and they would always talk about the Dodgers are playing the Reds. But – you know, Cincinnati has this one player, yeah, right. and it was Charlie Hustle, Pete Rose. Yes, right. And I saw him play, and I was like, wow. And yeah. everybody wanted to do head first slide. Yeah. And I would do it, and my chest, I would hit the chest. The ground, I, was so always my chest. I was always afraid of jamming my fingers. Your fingers, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. But when I recognized, you know, how Pete Rose was doing a head slide, he was way up here. He, when oh, he, yeah. When, when he was diving into the He would the launch. Bag. He would yeah. launch. Yeah. It, it was nowhere like he didn't slide down no, into no. the back. He slid up. And then Johnny Bench would block the plate. Yes. At, at home plate. Oh, yeah. man. Those are, that's my time. So if you're watching us, please forgive us. I know, right? Because <laughs> that is our time of yeah. uh, uh, baseball. And, and, and to see that and to see the Dodgers and growing up and see the, all those great teams mm -hmm. where they had, you know, Steve Garvey and Dusty Baker and mm -hmm. all yeah. those guys, Ron Say, and, yeah. you know, so many Davy yeah. Lopes. You know, I just remember all right. those guys. And, right. And watching them and but it's it's up. it's true like when you said people spend their life playing the sport and they never get to the winning level and baseball is a really hard game very difficult game mm -hmm. it's more difficult than just putting the ball in the hoop yeah oh and yeah 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 you can go in your backyard and shoot a basketball mm -hmm. and you played basketball yeah i played basketball yeah. and you can you know throw the ball to somebody one right. player you know in football like right. you, you know you got a wide receiver yeah but, but Absolutely. baseball has got to be yeah. a little, it's a little bit more complicated, you know. It's, it's, yeah. it's just those nine players on the field and, mm -hmm. and that guy on the mound that you got to look at, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and can you hit him? Are you afraid that you're going to get hit? <laughs> okay, so let's stop there for a minute. And we're talking about the greatest experiences you ever had. So who is the toughest pitcher you ever had to hit against? Nolan Ryan has to be the toughest guy I ever faced. Wow. And because Nolan was so different, he's from the old school, Bob Gibson, Tom Seaver. Uh, big man. Big man. You don't get in the box, he's looking at you like, get in the box. You know, you don't get in the box, he's going to throw something underneath your chin and let you know. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Wake, wake you up. up. <laughs> wake up, mighty man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's definitely going to wake you up. It's yeah. going to get your attention. And what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. So are you going to doubt yourself? You're going to be in fear? Mm hmm yeah, and, and so people who are not sports fans tuning in, Nolan Ryan is probably one of the greatest pitchers that ever pitchers that ever played the game. He pitched into his forties. Yes, and he was a a very powerful pitcher, 
And like you said, from the old school. And um, But you had some success against him, didn't you? I did, you know, but it was over a period of time, you know, after a couple times with him, just throwing gas completely by me and him looking at me like, go sit down, kid. Okay. That's when I was young. Okay. But when I stuck around a little bit, you know, the, the fire came in me mm. and we had some battles and, and I hit some off of him. I was like, go get it. You know, all right. There you go. And when you say when you say go get it, where did you hit the ball? That means go get it out of the park. Out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> that means the ball is gone. You hit it. Your left hand hit it. Your right field's gone. It's, it's gone wherever, wherever I, I made good contact with him, mm -hmm. it would go because he was generating the power. Okay. No, I was just using my hands. Yeah. So you just yeah. had to hit the ball. Just had to hit it. Had to make contact. Had to catch up with it. How many home runs did you hit off Nolan Ryan? Um, I don't know exactly. <laughs> I'm ne I, He's I've not never watching. I never I never <laughs> bragged about the fact that I yeah. mean I hit one off of him in the playoffs, but I never bragged about the fact that yeah. I, I hit home runs off of Nolan Ryan sure, because yeah, sure. I had a great deal of respect for him. Of course, absolutely. Because of you know, he was a different type of pitcher mm -hmm. and his demeanor was different. Absolutely. You know, when you look at guys, you know, when I used to come to the plate and I see a guy's in fear mm -hmm. of me, oh it's over. Mm -hmm. You know, I got him. Yeah. But when you look at a guy like Nolan, he's oh. looking at you like I'm the boss here. I'm the boss. The plate belongs to me. Yes, yes, yes. That's the kind of yeah. that's the kind of things you Absolutely. you learn about when you play the game of baseball. I love I love hearing these things because I kind of see like a lot of leadership qualities in this. You know, it, it takes a lot to be able to get in there and hit a baseball. It takes a lot to be able to throw a baseball, play the game at that level. Mm -hmm. I mean, mentally, how would you prepare uh, for these types of at bats and and things like that? I, I think as you grow. Mm -hmm. You become more confident in what you're doing. Oh, that's good. You know, and I think that's the same thing you're looking at when you talk about leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, you get in there and you learn, you know, some of the hard lessons. Mm -hmm. That's so important for us to be able to learn those first. Because if you don't learn those and you think you know it all, it's going to come back to bite you. Mm -hmm. And if you learn those, you know, lessons, then you can grow from it. Wow. You know, that's, that's what it was with me playing like that, you know, is being able to grow. So once I grew to this point, I was a different person. Which is incredible because from the very beginning of your career, you were already performing at a very high level, but then you're saying that even having those skills at the beginning as a rookie, because you were rookie of the year? Rookie of the year, 1983. Yeah, so that's enormous to win rookie of the year in baseball. So then you're rookie of the year, but then you still have to grow. You still have a lot to learn. Wow. We always will have a lot to learn about ourselves. I think it's the people that believe they don't have to learn anymore are the ones that can't achieve at the next level of growing. Wow. And because growing is a part of, of what we're all about. It's like the journey. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a real journey, you know, to be able to experience. And when I say this, this is what most people struggle with. Mm -hmm because they don't like to experience failure. Okay, good. See, failure is a part of succeeding. See, if we only just take the successful part of us and we don't experience the failure part, we can't put it all together. See, you tie it all together from what you've learned, you know, in, your, in failing, and now you put, put it all together, the, the two pieces together, so that brings you to a wholeness, you know, because that's what it did in baseball. Baseball is just like life. You know, I think a lot of people don't understand that. It's, mm -hmm. it's just like living life, you know, coming up, being a young player, you're going to go through some struggles, you're going to have some adversities, mm -hmm. but are you going to quit? Yeah. Are you going to dig in? Are yeah, you and especially when you're dealing with, like, it, when you're in a slump. And I think, you know, that word slump <laughs> is a baseball term where you're not hitting the ball, you know, you maybe four, five, six, I don't know how many at-bats a slump would be for you, but maybe one, two at-bats. Two for 32. Yeah, all two for 32. That was your greatest just, slump. Those are kind of slumps you can get into. Two hits out of 32 two. tries. Um, sometimes in life you go through slumps, don't you? You're right. Mm -hmm. Life is just the same way of going through the slumps in life, and, and it's those that don't give up, those that don't quit. Good Lord. You know, and I think – that was, you know, a big part of my learning lessons mm -hmm. in life is, is not quitting, mm -hmm. not giving up. I mean, because I quit before when I was in high school, mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought about that. I mm -hmm. always thought about that, and I use that as a great lesson for people. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in the 10th grade, I was a 
pouting baby, you know, and the coach, you know, I was running across the field and then I walked halfway and he thumped me in the head like that and said, don't ever walk off this field again. Yeah, right. You know, I'm 18 years old. I take the uniform off, throw it in his face and quit. Wow. But I realized in that quitting brought a, brought, brought an empty part inside of me. Okay. That's Emptiness. Okay. Absolutely. You know, because yeah. if you, if you quit on yourself like that, you, you never know. Yeah. There's a, be a great destiny for you. Yeah. You know, you never know the destiny that's sitting in front of you because now, how, how would you know that when you yeah. gave up? Wow. You know, and, and, and I think so many people do that in life too. You know, they yeah. just say, oh, well, this is not working. This is not working on my time because, you know, we are in today's times you know, where everybody's instant gratification. Fix me now. I right. want it now. Right. You know, right. and it doesn't work like that. No. Yeah. I heard someone say recently, God can work with a failure, but he can't work with a quitter. <laughs> That's good. You know, because as long as you're in the game and you're trying and you're pressing and you're pushing, which we're going to talk about today, pushing, keep on pushing, you know, push, pray until something happens, right? Right, that's good. Play until something happens, you know, something good's going to happen for those who push. And with God on your side, anything's possible. <laughs> That's why I love you. Do you get I, me inspired I, 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 to that, start preaching? Yeah, right there now. you go. <laughs> I mean, because that's so good, you know, and people need to understand that. You know, they need yeah. to understand the push. Yes. You know, the push yeah. pushes us into our destiny. Good Lord. You know, if I pull away my push and give up because I have some adversities, you know, then yeah. what do I have left? Mm. I have nothing. I guess. That means That means to me that I have no fight in me. Wow. You know, we can we can just talk about so many things. And I think what comes to mind right now, Daryl, when you're talking about, you know, we talked about the highest times and, and uh, you had some really great times and winning World Series and um, playing for great teams and you know, the Yankees. I mean, the greatest baseball team that ever existed, <laughs> even though I'm a Dodger fan. Well, I, I in my you. mind, the Dodgers are the greatest. Uh, and, all, and, and, and playing with all these great players and coaches and, and, and just doing so many great things and, and even the Mets and all this stuff. But um, something that comes along with success is criticism. And one thing that, you know, you know, following your career pretty much your whole life, um, you dealt with a lot of criticism. How important is it to, within yourself, deal with criticism effectively? I think people need to understand it. it's part of life. Mm. Because they're not criticizing you if you're not doing anything. Oh, that's good. And if you can't do anything, mm -hmm. why would they? It's like you yeah. gotta stick your neck out. Yeah, you know, well, if, if you're not doing anything that, that, that's having an impact, why would they criticize you? Because they'd be like, oh, well, he's not really doing anything. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you, you know, the devil doesn't pay attention to anybody that's not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, exactly. Why would he pay attention? Why did he, he wasn't paying attention to me when I wasn't doing anything for the kingdom guy. Mm -hmm. He was just like letting me run wild and loose. Yeah. Didn't yeah. care. You know, it's like, I already got him. What do I need to worry yeah. about him for? But even with the media, like, they were always kind of like really on you and Doc and, right? Doc Gooden. And, Doc, and, yes. And, yeah. They were, you know. And, 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 but that's okay, you know. I mean, because. It made me a better person, mm. you know, and I think a lot of times people think being criticized, you know, it, is, is unfair. Yeah, is it unfair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But hey. But you got to be ready for it. You pay a price for the talent that you have. Okay, that's good. Okay. It's part so of it. It's, par it's part of it is, and certain players play at a different level and they make things look a different way at easy doing what they're doing. So... The media has to criticize you but, when you but the thing when is, you lack, you know. Yeah, but the thing about it is that to play any sport in New York City, you're gonna be criticized. The level of criticism criticism in that city is probably at a whole nother level. Well, of course, you know, because when you play in New York City and you come to the ballpark every day like we were, and most people don't understand, when I won my first championship, I was 24. Yeah, right. they act like I was thirty four. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. You know, mm -hmm. you know, for, for the fact of struggling in the playoffs and World Series, so they were acting like I had been there for like fifteen years. You know, mm -hmm. because of the expectations, the high level of playing, you know, mm -hmm. was different. You know, because the bar was so high for me and the white because we were young and mm -hmm. we were very talented. You know, so um, you play in New York and you go into the clubhouse every day. You walk into the clubhouse, you got fifty reporters come in the clubhouse. Oh my 
you go somewhere else, you know, to play, and you got two reporters, three reporters, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it makes more sense to be on the road for us than to be at home because yeah. when we're at home, we got to deal with all these New York outlets, you know, <laughs> to be able to talk about, well, why are you struggling? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me why you're struggling. Why didn't you hit the ball? That's that's amazing. Well, that, that's good. I mean, because you know what I used to tell them? Well, I said, I suck right now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I would just be honest about it, you know, because I was sucking, you know, and, I, mm-hmm. and that's part of it. Um, that's part of playing mm-hmm. at the highest level. That's part of playing under the pressure and under mm-hmm. the spotlight. Yeah. You know, because when you play under the spotlight, someone is not going to like you. Yeah, right. But you know what? I, 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 I had to learn that because I realized that, well, that's really not my problem, mm-hmm. you know, for me to want people to like me. Because if we mm-hmm. all sit around and we want people to like us, oh, well, we'll be waiting forever. That's so true. You know, you just said something. You would tell them, like, you know, you would say, you know, I'm sucking right now. I'm not doing great right now. I feel like in leadership, it's so important to be real but to be loving. Yes. And do you feel that you get farther with people by just being real? You do. And being honest to yourself. Mm. You know, and I think that goes for every leader that wants to be a leader and mm. be in leadership, you know, to, to be true to yourself. Mm. And if you can be true to yourself, people truly have respect for that. Wow. You know, and I think a lot of times people don't think they will, mm-hmm. but they do. Yeah. Because what are you saying here? It's really important. Yeah, I'm not perfect. Yeah, because people, you know, people put people up on this high pedestal and I try to make like, you know, yeah. you're so perfect. You have it all together. You look yeah. right. You look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but in reality, that's not true. No. You know, the the reality of life is what falling short. Yes. Why do we fall short? So we can get back up. Yes. Yeah. You know, because you can you can fall short. You can stay there, but if you determine, you're going to get back up. Mm. And when you get back, what people don't understand, Pastor Owls, when you get back up, you become better because you have now been through the trials and tribulations and yeah. things, and you have endured those. And it's really true, like, whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. I know that's a cliche, but I've experienced that in my life. Like, when I've pushed through those hard seasons yeah. and pushed through, you know, uh, cancer with my daughter, and I know you, you're a two-time cancer survivor. There's so much to, to your story. <laughs> um, my daughter... Uh, was healed from cancer and and she's now I think over 10 years disease free and you know when you push through these types of problems in the when you're in the midst of them you feel like they're going to take you out Mm -hmm. but when you come through you come through so much stronger don't you you come out better on the Mm -hmm. other side and I think uh, I think that's sometimes people feel like well that's that's me being a risk taker well no we take we take a risk in everything else yeah it's true a lot of other things you know, but we don't we don't have, you know, the ability to have you know the faith to believe that coming out on the other side could be better for me. Yeah, right. right. And that's what I said. That's where your fight have to come in. Yeah. You know, you have to be strong. You have to have a backbone. You know, and I I think growing up where I grew up in South Central Los Angeles uh, gave me the backbone that I needed to have. Yeah. And right. I'm grateful for all of that. You know, I, I think a lot of people. You know, be like, well, I wish I didn't grow up like I did. I wish I didn't have to go through so much. I would, well, you can wish, wish, wish. Right. But but I did have to go through them. Yeah, right. You know, and I always say, you got to go through to get to. Right. Yeah. My yeah. wife asked me a question the other day, and you might relate. She told me, she asked me, if you were to look back on your past, would you change anything? And in a heartbeat, I said, no. Because it is our story. And, you know, in our world, Daryl, uh, our world being the church world, the kingdom of God, we know that it's all those things that produce an anointing in your life. And when you get up there to preach like you did this morning, there was such an anointing flowing out of you. And it's just amazing. It's, it's so different, right? Right. Because we make it not about us. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're thankful. Like you sit here and I sit here. Right. I'm thankful for the struggles. Because the struggles bring great victory and the great victory brings God's presence over your life. I think a lot of people don't understand that they push back from, you know, whatever has happened, hurt and and they don't understand. Okay. Let's pull back because I think we we just missed something so heavy. The struggle brings great victory 
and the great victory brings God's presence. God's presence in your life. Wow. You know, yeah, it, it, it does. It just, I don't know why he does it that way, but I guess he's not like us. So he doesn't, he doesn't sit there and think, yeah. well, you know, my pain is so deep, I can't get over it. Right. He's like, well, I'm going to take your pain and I'm going to turn it into your victory. <laughs> and, when I, and when I turn it into your victory, you're going to have this great gift that I'm going to give you. And just remember, it's my gift. You never, see, if you never get past the fact that it's his gift, he'll flow it through you. Yes. And I think so many get to that place and they've been that place and they wonder how did they lose it because then it became all about them. See, I would never make it about me. I would always make it about God, you know, because mm -hmm. when you make it about him, now he can flow through you supernaturally. Like when, like you said this morning when I got up there, when I get in worship and hear worship and the churches, I'm in the church, mm -hmm. it's the church. Yes. It's the whole atmosphere. The only thing I can't do is I can't sing, because if I could sing, I would tear the house down. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> hey, you know, it, there'd be so much anointing if you could say. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, that we had such a great time this morning, and God really used you, but these are things I think that are building people who really don't understand why they go through these different struggles and why, you know, sometimes they say life's unfair. Yeah. Right. And we get a lot of that. Yeah. get a lot of that, but God uses your pain, turns it into your victory, uses your pain, turns it into your pulpit, uses your message, turns it into your message. Right. I mean, uh, your, your mess. your mess and turns it into a message. And there's just so many places you can go with that, but you're walking in that you're experiencing that. And I think, you know, it's been pretty publicized, the struggles you had in the past. And I don't think, you know, anybody can just research that and talk about, you know, you were in prison. Yes. And uh, you went through some heavy things. What was the lowest time of your professional career? Well, I think um, being in prison, um, ending up in the Florida State Prison because of addiction, mm. you know, with a T17169. But I, I look at it now. And I, would, I think about God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And what I mean by that, he was stopping me and not letting the enemy kill me. <laughs> wow. Because. <laughs> See, people, I don't know if people catch that. I, I don't know if they do either. You know, It's like prison rescue deal yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah, he, he stopped me. You know, there's, there's stopping points in our life that he stops the sickness or this or that, whatever it may be, because God can. Whatever it is, he can restore it. Yeah, yeah, but you, what you're saying is that you were going so wild. Yes. I was so wild, so he would stop me at points, you know, mm. bouts with cancer, a prison, this, that. You know, he's, those were stopping points. Because now I look back and I realize that he was saving me from my own self. Oh, man, so powerful. Because he knew that the destructive behavior was so deep, he didn't let the enemy kill me. Right. You know, so people can say what they want to say, but it's God's decision. It's not ours or anybody else's decision. Do you yeah. feel like God is so big that he finds a man who's going through this whole process, but all along, it's not even about the man, it's about the people. Right. And somehow, like, he was already fashioning you right. to be a messenger to his people. You know why? I think because God already knows the humility of a man. Mm. You know, he doesn't look at the status of a man. He looks at the heart of a man. What kind of heart does this man have? Does he have a heart for me, or does he have a heart for himself? You know, and I, and I, I think that's what really catches God's attention more than anything um, when you think about all the different people he used in the Bible, they all had issues just like us. That's true. Struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, there, there's were trials and tribulations. But why was he picking those guys, you know? Moses, yeah. humility, meekness. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. David, a man after my own heart. He's not looking at, he's not looking at how successful Dow Strawberry was. Absolutely. He was looking at my heart. He said, that, that's a heart that's going to go back, and he's going to love people. He's going to show the what, the importance of what others are. You know that God still loves them too, no matter where no matter where they at. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we forget that because of understanding the Bible. And when I say that, it's this is so important, Pastor Al. 
the Bible is simple, but we're very complicated people. It's a simple book for complicated people. Oh, that's so good. You know, and it's not until we come to the place of understanding the Bible, then we understand us. Mm -hmm. Wow, this, this is heavy. I'm just feeling <laughs> God right now. Uh, if you're listening or watching, you know, it, it's just amazing what's taking place here. You know, uh, this morning you said something pretty heavy, pretty profound. You said God is doing his job, but he needs men that are going to do theirs. And God has given you like a very special heart for men. And uh, it's a part of your ministry now. And you minister to men all over the country, all over the world. Um, how important is it in this time uh, for men to take their place in the house of God and in their own homes? It's very important to be able to take your rightful place now in these times. Because it looked like things are winding down, you know, and the enemy's, you know, 24-7. So that means as a believer, as a man, you got to be 24-7. Mm -hmm. You got to be 24-7 focused on kingdom things. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get your eyes focused on the earthly things because if you do, you'll get distracted, mm -hmm. you know, and you'll, you'll miss out on the information that God's trying to get to you, mm -hmm. you know, because God is always trying to get information to us. Ooh. You know, because I think what people don't understand, his information brings revelation. Ooh. You know, it, God is always trying to get information to us. That's a big, big statement. He's always trying to get information to us. You know, it, we can think, well, I know guys think a lot of times preachers think, well, I know a lot about the Bible. But he's like, yeah, you know a lot about the Bible, but the devil know the Bible, too. Mm -hmm. OK, and you got to remember, he was a part of being up here in this kingdom before you. So he knows yeah. when you start to veer off and you start to, you know, stray yeah. into another way, another thinking, and in your own, you start to think into right. your own. Yeah, I, I feel like, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the, the, all of time, Satan hasn't changed his tactics, but he's gotten better at them. Yes. He's, and he studies our words. He studies, he can't get into our minds, but he studies our actions. He studies our behaviors. And then he crafts strategies to <laughs> counterfeit the things of God. And I think part of the heartbeat of this podcast is to kind of go into social media because it seems like right now he's really using social media to go after our young men, isn't he? Right. And you know what happened to men? They fool themselves. Mm. You know, they fool themselves with stuff, mm. you know, and things they like. Mm -hmm. And then they think, well... Nobody knows. Or the devil knows. Right. You know? Hate I mean, you've driven probably the best cars. Yeah. And stayed in the best hotels and eaten at the best restaurants. I mean, it's kind of overhyped, isn't it? It is. It's, it's, it's always been and always will be. You know, and when you look at it from the perspective that I know about, because, see, I re I've already been to the top of the mountain. Nothing up there. Yeah. Right. You know, so everybody's like really, guys are really chasing, well, if I can get to the top of the mountain. But you don't understand you get to the top of the mountain, you're going to be lonely because nobody's going to be your friend. You know, you're not going to have really, really true friends. Right. You're going to have people that want to be around you because mm -hmm. of what you do. I was sitting with uh, Michael Francis, and, and he's a mutual friend of ours. Um, he was in the Italian, American Italian mafia. And I asked him this question. I'm going to ask you the same question. What is success? What is success to Daryl Strawberry, what is true success? True success is living out the purpose of your life, of why you were really created mm -hmm. and what you were created for. Mm -hmm. And that was to come to know Christ and come to love other people. You know, it has nothing to do with, you know, the, the success of achieving you know, trophies and all that stuff. That's just a part of what we do here. We get to do that. Mm -hmm. But who am I? And, and and I think so many of us never dive into that. You know, we hold on to the titles and we hold on to the jersey and mm -hmm. we hold on to the fame. Mm -hmm. And you, you're still running around in the same circle after many years of retired. Mm -hmm. You know, you never entered into the place of purpose for your life. Wow. You know, and the purpose of, the, the purpose of in the beginning, mm -hmm. What did God create? You right, know, he, right. He created. He created everything so that we would walk in mm -hmm. His goodness. Yes, you know, and 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 that's what's really important at the mm -hmm. end of the day. That's what success is. Is when you when you reach the pinnacle of walking in 
God's goodness and his biblical principles, now you have attained something. You, you know, now you, mm -hmm. now you uh, really have arrived to a different place because you, you, your, your mindset is different. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it thinks at a different level. It thinks at a higher level. It doesn't think from an earthly perspective. It right. thinks from a kingdom perspective. But it kind of goes back to what you're saying about how you started your career and you played you know, at this high level and then you suffered and you went through a lot of things. And then through those things, he made you strong. And it takes a little bit of time, right, to get to that point <laughs> where you really are comfortable with who you are, aren't, isn't it? Of course it does. But I mean, it's like kind of that's kind of what success is. It's not. It's more the journey. Yeah, yeah it, it is the whole journey. You know, it's not half of it. It's not this part of it. It's the whole journey of everything about you. You know, because when you come to know God and you come to know him over the period of time then he shows you the whole picture of you you know he has uh, to be able to show you the whole picture because if, if you don't ever look at the whole picture you you think you always think you have it, you've had it together mm -hmm. well that's a lie that's how many so many guys you know who end up in ministry end up yeah. not in the vic victory part of ministry right. because they believe now i'm here but they forgot they were here <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about uh, a painting, a masterpiece. And so the artist, you know, sometimes he's working with different colors and he's painting it. And if you stand close to a painting, you only see one section of it. It's not very appealing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all, maybe even you may not understand it. It doesn't even look. But when you step away from it and you see the full work. And when I look at you, Daryl, it's like and you're a little older than me. you got a long way to go still, but... Your, your painting is much more developed than mine. Yeah. Or my painting is much more developed than somebody else's. Right. But in the end, God's making a masterpiece. And right. It's and that's what amazing he does. to watch. That's, you know, that's what God does. He makes a masterpiece. You know, it takes a person like you and me from where we have come from. It takes the broken pieces of who I was from the, I was broken before I ever put the uniform on. So God already knew that. You know, the uniform just covered up, you know, the pain and all that, you know, but it didn't change it. It was still there. You know, it just kind of covered up, putting it on and becoming this athlete. But he, God saw it. God, God <laughs> saw it. He, he, he saw it from the beginning. You know, he does not miss anything. He does not miss any details about you. Why? It's because he loves you. And people don't need to, need to understand he's crazy about you. He's crazy about all that junk in your trunk and everything else. And so I can bring you into a place and I can bring you and I will take you to leadership. God has taken me to leadership of the kingdom because he realized that he can trust me, that I he would put it in my hands and he know that I will give it away. Wow. This has been great. <laughs> And if people know, we, we, we'll go. Like we'll talk, we'll talk, and we'll talk, and and uh, we're gonna have a great weekend with you. You're gonna be with us tomorrow. Um, you've done so much. What are you doing right now, Daryl? That really excites you. I know you wrote a book. Uh, you've promoted that book. It's probably it's done very, very well, and all of your books have done well. But what are you excited about doing right now in your ministry and in your life? What's the most exciting thing you're doing? Winning souls. It's it's exciting. I get chills when I think about what the Holy Spirit is about to do. My goodness. Because he's about to speak and he's about to touch somebody's heart and he's about to change somebody just like he did me. I don't ever want to forget that feeling. It's not about a book. It's not about that. I mean, yeah. I've, I've done all that. Sure, sure, sure. And, and that's good, you know. But, man, I'm telling you, when he's, when he's about to win some souls, I mean, I get excited. You know, I just, I just... You know, my focus, even going to other places, I can go back to, you know, the baseball diamond field and I can throw out the first pitch and go back to old timers, but I'm only there for a minute, but I got to go back to what Jesus called me to oh, do. Wow, you know, it, I don't want to miss, I don't ever want to miss out on that. Just like I don't want to miss a game when, when it was on the line to hit a home run, I don't want to miss that soul that he's about to win. God gets all the glory, man. Yes, you got it, man. Thanks for having me, man. Darryl, I love you, man. man, I love you, bro, <laughs> and I'm just so blessed by you and everything that God's using you to do. You've been such a blessing to me, to Same our ministry, here. and uh, to all of us. And we have a little audience in here today. I know they're all getting 
blessed right now. But uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in to Catch Fire with my good friend Dale Strawberry. Be sure to subscribe, share this with somebody. I think a good title for this podcast is Your Life is a Masterpiece. And I really feel like you are farther along than me, but God has really made a masterpiece out of your life, Daryl. And we love you. Thanks for thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Pastor. I love you guys too. Thanks for having me. Oh, I love great. your ministry. Oh, I love you too, man. Subscribe. We'll see you next time.